Welcome to another video. In this video, we are going to go through the proof of the rational root theorem. I'm assuming you know what the rational root theorem is. Now, if you don't know it, I'm going to tell you what it means. Let's take the most common example that we find. It's usually the quadratic equation. So suppose you're given a quadratic equation, say it is um, 2x squared minus 3x plus, let's pick a number, let's pick 6 is equal to 0. And you want to see if this can be factored or not. Now, if this can be factored, we say it has rational roots. If it cannot be factored, it does not have rational roots. You'll end up with some weird square roots of something that you cannot easily find because that thing is not a perfect square, so it is not rational. But suppose it has a rational root. That rational root has to have this form. Remember the word rational means you can write it as a ratio or a fraction. So it has to be something on top of something. So it has to be something like A over B where there's no number that divides A and also divides B. But what this theorem says is if there's a rational root, then whatever is sitting on top here must divide 6. So all you have to think now is think of all numbers that can divide 6. Let's start thinking of every number that can divide 6. Well, they are plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, or plus or minus 6. So A must be one of these numbers. If A is not one of these numbers, it cannot be a rational root of this equation. And then let's go to the bottom. The bottom has to be a number that divides 2. And that simply means the bottom has to be one of these numbers, plus or minus 1, or plus or minus 2. So these are the only possible... So now, how many combinations can you have? How many of these can you... There's so many. It can be 1 over 1, plus, or plus 1 over... So how many... Let's see how many rational roots we can generate from here. Let's start. We're going to keep everything over this. So it's going to be plus 1, plus 1, or minus 1. We're going to be plus 2, divided by 1 or minus 2. It's going to be plus 3 or minus 3. And it's going to be plus 6 or minus 6. Those are the options you get when this is the denominator. Now, what if this is the denominator? We're going to start from here again. It's going to be plus 1 over 2 or minus 1 over 2. 1 over 2. We're done with this one. You go here. It's going to be 2 over 2 or 2 or minus 2 over 2 is going to be plus up because 2 over 2 is 1. So this answer is going to show up again. We don't need to repeat that because that's what you're going to get. So we go to the third option. It's going to be plus 3 over 2 or minus 3 over 2. And the final answer is going to be um, plus 6 over 2 or minus 6 over 2, or you switch it, but that's going to give us 3 in either case, so we don't need to repeat it. So all the possible rational roots of this polynomial equation is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. There are 12 possible rational roots. So you can as well just take each of them and try to plug them in and see if you're going to get zero. If none of these gives you a zero, it means there is no rational root. And if you find a root, that root is not rational unless it is one of these 12 we just listed out. So that's the thing about the rational root theorem. It states that if you have a polynomial and it has a rational root, if that rational root can be written as a over b, then A must divide the constant, and B must divide the leading coefficient. That's it. That's another way to state it. And we want to show why that is always true. Let's get into the video. Let us begin with A 
polynomial, right? We just want to find a polynomial, any polynomial. And the general form of a polynomial is this. We just say, um, let's say let p of x be equal to cn x to the n plus cn minus 1 x to the n minus 1. Uh, just give me a second. Plus, we have c1 x plus c0. Now, this is the general form of all polynomials. If it's a quadratic, then you, you just need three terms, okay? You're just going to have, the, the biggest power here is going to be 2. If it is a cubic function, this is going to be 3. And these ends are just to show you they are attached to this. The end doesn't, it's, it's not, it's just telling you that they are ordered and attached to whatever power it is. And note, this polynomials will have this cn, cn minus 1, all the way, all the, um, the coefficients of the terms in the polynomial are integers. There are no square root functions, there are no, I mean, there are no square root irrationals, and there are no pi's, there are no e's, they are integers, okay? They could be positive or negatives. So, let's say where cn, cn minus 1, um, all the way to c1, and c0 are integers okay it is important that they are integers because if they are not then what we're doing doesn't make any sense now what's the other thing you need to do we need to say assuming this polynomial has a rational root okay so let's say suppose suppose this polynomial p of x has a rational root has a rational root r let's call it r then there are two things about the roots of any polynomial two okay one thing about the root and another thing if the root is rational then number one r is equal to a over b you can write, the word rational means you can write it as a fraction, okay? Such that there is no common factor of A and B, so that A is relatively prime to B. I'm going to put that as a fact here. Um, we'll just say A is relatively prime to B. Relatively prime simply means there is no number that can divide A and can also divide B. So 2 over 3 is actually a rational number, is a true fraction, because there's no number that can divide 2 and also divide 3. And those are the kinds of numbers we're talking about, not 2 over 6. 2 over 6 is not a proper rational number. Okay, that's why you get punished if you don't reduce the fraction. Because it is rational, we can write it this way. The second condition is because it is the root of this polynomial, if you plug it into the polynomial and p of this root must be equal to zero. That is the remainder theorem. If you plug in the zero of a polynomial, actually that's why we call it a zero or a root. Remember when you solve your equation, it's where it crosses the x-axis, that's when the value of the function is equal to zero, that's when you get your answer. So you must get zero for the value of the polynomial. So these are the two things we're going to use for this proof. Let's begin. So we know that if we plug in r into the polynomial, it's going to be zero. Okay, we can say that is, we said r is a over b. So I'm going to try to plug in r anywhere I see x in this function. So that is, I have cn, I have a over b raised to power n plus cn minus 1 a over b raised to power n minus 1 plus tap 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 plus c1 a over b raised to power 1 um, plus co will be equal to 0. Okay, because this is a 0 of the polynomial and by the remainder theorem you're supposed to get 0. Okay, so now because I have a bunch of fractions, fractions, fractions here, what I'm going to do is 
I'm going to multiply. I just want to make sure I don't have something under. So get rid of all the fractions. But when you want to get rid of fractions, you multiply by the biggest fraction you have, the biggest denominator. Look, b raised to power n, because when you distribute this, this would be a to the n, b to the n. So I'm going to multiply every term here by b raised to power n. So we multiply to the top. Okay, b raised to power n. So watch this. If I multiply this by b raised to power n, what I'm going to have left is going to be c sub n. a raised to power n remains. But b raised to power n is cancelled out by b raised to power n. So I move on to the next one. If I go here, I'm going to still have my c to the n minus 1 times a raised to power n minus 1 is still there. a raised to power n minus 1. And then I'm going to have, see this is b raised to power n minus 1, b raised to power, sorry, uh, b raised to power 1 over b raised to power n minus 1 times b raised to power n. You see this? It's going to be, I'm going to have one extra b on top because there are fewer b's here than here by 1. So I'm going to still have b. And then I keep going. That's going to happen. The value of b will keep increasing. Here was 0, now it's 1, it's going to become 2 later. So we keep going until we get to, when you get here, look, b raised to power n, this is going to become c1, a, b raised to power n minus 1, because you'll have more b's here. You just reduce it by 1, which is just this one. And for the last term, you're going to have just c o, b raised to power n. Nothing cancels any of the b's. And your answer on the right, if you multiply 0 by b raised to power n, is going to be 0. We're almost done, because if you pay attention, let's start with the a, actually. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to isolate this, and I'm going to move everything away to the other side. cn, a to the n, will be equal to, if I move everything to the other side, let's start moving from here. I'm going to have negative CO, B to the N. If I move this also, I'm going to have minus C1, A, B to the N, minus 1, minus, tap, 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 minus, A to the N, minus 1, B. See, I've moved everything to the other side. Don't forget I have four terms, one, two, three, four, that I'm showing. There are multiple terms in the middle. I just skipped. Okay, so I just brought this, I kept this one here, moved everything else to the other side. So what happens? Now, let's try and do some factoring. There is something that is common to all of these terms. Do you know what that is? This contains it, this contains it, and this contains it. What is it? It's B, the same thing. Everybody has B. So... Look, it means that cn, a to the n, this n is too big, c sub n, a to the n is equal to, what that, what's that? You have, let's pull out negative b. What do you have left? I'm going to have co, because I've reduced this b by 1, I divide, I pulled out 1b, this is going to reduce to n minus 1. This sign is going to change to plus because of this minus here. And I'm going to have a, um, what do I have now? I have c1, a, b to the n minus 2. And I'm going to have plus, tap, 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 plus, until I get to the final one, which is c, n minus 1, a to the n minus 1. And I've removed this b, so that's all I have left. Perfect. Now, this is where it becomes very um, important. Look. Hey, by the way, these are integers. I hope you know that these are integers. Okay, A is relatively prime to B, and A, B integers. Let me write, just write it here. A and B are integers or natural numbers. Let me just say natural numbers. So we know that 0 is not one of it. B is not equal to 0. Okay? I think that covers it. I forgot to say that at the beginning. Now, look. Everything here is an integer. Now, because b is multiplying an integer, it is a factor of cn times a to the n. A factor means you can write this as something times something. That's the meaning of... So we can write cn, a to the n, as 
negative b or b times any number, right? Which is also an integer. That means that b must divide this number. But we know that b does not divide a, or there's no common factor between a and b, no matter how many times you repeat it. So if two and three have no common factor, it doesn't matter how many times you repeat two, three will not divide your answer, right? Because this will always be a multiple of two and three cannot divide any multiple of two, any, not multiple, any power of two, okay? So what we're saying now is that this B, since it does not divide A to the N, it must divide C sub N. So we say that B divides c sub n a to the n but b does not divide a to the n and if b does not divide a to the n it must divide whatever is multiplying it then b divides and that's the whole idea of B being a factor of C sub N. What again is C sub N? It is the very first, the leading coefficient of the polynomial. So B, the denominator of your rational expression, will always be a factor of C sub N. And that's the idea for the second one, the same idea. Similarly, we can do the same thing and say, so you know how we isolated this? from here, what if we isolated this? What we're gonna get is CO B to the N will be equal to, so we're gonna move this over. We're gonna have CN A to the N, CN A to the N, and then we move this over, it's gonna be minus CN minus one, A to the N minus one B plus Tap, tap, not plus, minus, minus. Okay, I think I'm gonna do this same state. Okay, I want you to see it, let's keep going. Okay, so it's gonna be minus, it's just the dots are harder to write this way. And then, so we've moved these two, now we need to move this guy. So it's gonna be C1, A, B to the N, minus one, minus. Okay, so what is common to each of these terms? It is A. So we can factor out A, so it means that, um, it means that C sub zero B to the N is equal to negative A times B to the N minus one. Okay, so you can see that A must be a factor of C O B N, so A, divides C O B to the N, but A is relatively prime, should have said it that way, to B, therefore, therefore A divides C O. Now, this is all. I think I should have stated that I needed everything to be on the board. Okay, I should have stated the theorem clearly, but that's the theorem I did explain from the beginning. And suppose this, we're trying to claim that this is what's gonna happen, that A must divide that and that. Okay. <clears throat> I don't have more space on the board, but I hope you understand what happened here. Leave a comment in the comment section. Never stop learning. Those who stop learning, stop living. Bye-bye.